it's no field. If there's no field, then soon there won't be anybody around the table. Praise God. Walk around and just greet a few persons in the name of the Lord. Greet them very warmly. So we are on the subject of intense Christianity, and um, last Wednesday we started our sixth lesson. And we were not able to finish. We're going to try and finish up this evening. I'd like for us to stand. And we're going to read our focus passage. Philippians chapter 3, verses 1 to 14. would like for us to read responsively as we have been doing. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. And remember, when we touched this, we said that our rejoicing should be in the Lord, not in ourselves, not in our accomplishments, but in the Lord. It is not very difficult for us to be persuaded to focus on ourselves. To write the same things to you, to me, indeed, is not grievous. But for you, it is safe. Now, that wasn't everybody, so it tells me we are distracted. 
So I'm going to give you 10 seconds to look around. Look at the hats that all the ladies are wearing. Maybe the new shoes. When we're dealing with intense Christianity, we can't be distracted. So take 10 minutes to just absorb what everybody has on and take 10 minutes. 10 seconds, sorry. Let's try again. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord to write the same things to you. To me, indeed, is not grievous, but for you, it is safe. For we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit. And rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Just to revise, Paul wasn't saying that everything that he had accomplished in his own life was worthless. What he was saying is when compared to the worth of knowing Jesus Christ, all the things that I have inherited or accomplished are as garbage when I compare them. When I compare them. So most of us are still a long way off from Paul. Because even when we consider the worth of our relationship with Jesus Christ, we still value a lot the things that we have accomplished in life. And we'll boast about them too. Some of us will. But Paul goes further in this verse. And he says, my situation is not hypothetical. I have suffered the loss of all things. I'm not just talking about, you know, a situation that might happen. Paul says, before... I suffered the loss of all things. When I came to know Jesus Christ, I realized what would happen. And I reckoned that what I had to lose was worthless compared to what I would gain by knowing Jesus Christ. And then he says, when I did in fact suffer the loss, of these things. My opinion didn't change. My opinion didn't change. Very important. He says, I count all things but loss. And he says, when I suffer the loss of all things, I do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. 
and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Now, brethren, I hope you are understanding what we are trying to say. While it is true that we are not, most of us do not consider ourselves under the law of Moses, Paul's reference here to law doesn't just include the law of Moses. But some of us have placed ourselves and indirectly each on other under certain laws. And we feel that if others don't abide by the laws which we have put ourselves under, that they are not righteous. You understand that, brethren? We just have to tell you the truth in God and lie not. And, and we just have to deal with it. Verse 10, please read that. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. But this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. When we come to it, we'll see, brethren, that it is not possible to reach for the things which are before until we forget the things which are behind. Some of you are concentrating too much on your failures. And others of us are concentrating too much on our successes. We need to forget the things which are behind. Verse 14, let's read that together. So just before you're seated, when we met last time, we looked at the fact that Paul speaks of two kinds of righteousness. His own righteousness and God's righteousness. And we repeatedly asked the question last week, which brand of righteousness do you have? Which brand of righteousness is the one that governs your life? Is it your own righteousness, which is of the law? Or is it the righteousness, which is of God by faith in Christ Jesus? And we spoke about the two different kinds of righteousness. So we did that, and um, we made the point, and we have been making the point, and so much so that it has spilled a little into what we do on a Sunday, that God, God saved us by grace alone, without any contribution from our part. And we found out that even the faith, that we used to believe God was given to us by God. You know that Paul said, we didn't do this, but you know Paul said, it is the goodness of God that leadeth thee to repentance. Brethren, you could not repent unless the goodness of God took you by the hand. I don't know how we think we have a big part to play in the thing, you know. You know what my role is? When God takes me by the hand, my role is to go with him. My role is not to pull back. But it's not that I'm the one pulling Jesus, you know. I said, Jesus, I want to repent. Help me, no man. 
is you stopping me from repenting. Every time you feel the conviction of the Holy Ghost, you ought to lift your hands and say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I can still feel conviction. I still feel that this is wrong. It's not of me, it's of you. It's a sign that you still love me. You're still working with me. You still want me to be right. You think conviction is a bad thing? Then we looked at verse 10 a little bit. Oh, so, so powerful. I, we can never do justice to it. I, I can't. I, I believe that there are teachers who could, honestly, but I know I can't. You know, this, this that I may know him. And we looked at the cry that came from the heart of Moses. The cry that came from the heart of David. Men who just wanted to know God. All right, you may be seated. So now, what we want to find out is what is in Paul's mind when he speaks about knowing God. This is what Paul says, in effect. All I want is to know Christ. And to experience the power of his resurrection. To share in his sufferings. And become like him in his death. And brethren, I'm saying it doesn't get more intense than this. It cannot. This is where the rubber meets the road. This is the test of Christianity. So Paul realizes that knowing Christ involves experiencing the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, and being and, and being made conformable to his death. So when I say I want to know you, Jesus, understand that you are asking a hard thing. That is not coming on a Sunday night and singing, when we all get to heaven. No, it's more than that, brethren. It's more than a little shalama kalama. You see. More than that. Listen now. The power of his resurrection does not mean the power by which Christ was raised from the dead or the power of Christ by which Paul would be raised from the dead. Rather, it refers to the power of the resurrected Christ, which is at work in the life of the believer through the Holy Spirit, raising him from death in sin to the new life in Christ. Paul wants to know in an experiential way the power of Christ's resurrection. The same power which raised Christ from the dead. Paul wants to experience that surging through his being. overcome sin in his life and to produce the fruit of the spirit. Paul says, that's how I want to know him. Listen now, brethren, this might surprise you, 
But Paul is not talking about power to work miracles. I'm sorry. See, you know how we know that Paul wasn't talking about that? How do you think we know that Paul wasn't talking about that? Because he was doing that already. You see, when Paul wrote this, his experience was that if you're sick, you come to me for my handkerchief. This is the Paul that has founded churches in Asia Minor and in Europe. This church that he was writing to, Philippian church. Philippian church was one of the churches he founded in his missionary journeys. He started that church. You remember what happened at Philippi? When he and Silas were put in prison. And at midnight there was what? A great earthquake. All these things Paul had already witnessed. You know? So Paul not talking about miracles. Some of us when we say we want the power of God. That's what we talk about. Because you see that again. Is going to be, bring us glory. When we talk about, I want to demonstrate the power of God, is really not for God's glory, you know. We, we want our names to be up there. So me want the power. And that's why we are tempted to exhibit ourselves so much. That's why we have a strong desire to show ourselves so much. But Paul is saying here, brethren, what Paul is saying is, Jesus, there was something resident in you that even when you were placed in the grave, the normal process of decay and corruption could not overtake your body because of the power that resided in you. So he's saying, Jesus, there is decay in my physical, spiritual body. There's a lot of corruption in me. There's a lot of nastiness in me. I've founded many churches, but I still feel it. I've opened blind eyes, but I feel it still. Still fighting against some old stuff. So I need some resurrection power. To surge in my innermost being. To lift me out of the nastiness. Stop the decay. That's what I want. Because I know that I can start churches. And still go to hell. And know that I can heal people. And still lose my way. So Lord you see the corruption that is in me. Send resurrection power. Overcome the negative thoughts that want to control me sometimes. Power of his resurrection. I want to know you that way. Some people just want to know Jesus so that he can tell him who you must marry. Lord, is six I have on my mind, you know, which one? If 
Valentine's Day come, Lord, and I give out six cards. Each of them was written to my one and only. Six one and only you one half. So really what we want is a Santa Claus Jesus. We want... Paul said, Lord, I'm tired of sinning, repenting, sinning, repenting. Can't I have some consistent victory? I'm tired of one step forward, two step backwards. Send some resurrection power. That's how I want to know you. My, my, my drawing close to you must not be so that I can boast that I feel your anointing. My drawing close to you must have the effect of making me better. I want to be changed. I don't like the way I am. Power of his resurrection. That's how I want to know you. Want to be changed. I'm tired of the old me being in control. Anybody tired of the old you being in control? Power of his resurrection. Just lift your hands and worship Jesus. That's how I want to know you. My, my, my brethren, my wanting to know God is not so that I can rub up, rub up on Jesus, you know. See, when I, when, when I, when I, when I'm in the presence of other people, they must know that I know Jesus. Without me having to sing a gospel song and they hear. They must smell the aroma of Jesus all over me. Something is different about this young man. Middle-aged man, sorry. It's because, of, it's because what people call me when I go away, you know. So we have a young man here. Sometimes I feel so good. <laughs> young man. Oh, yes, brethren. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Uh, Paul says, I want to be found to be in him. When you observe me, you must know this operation is different from the normal Operation. I'm, I'm kind of tired of the Christianity that not affecting the lives of others. I'm tired of the Christianity that can't be exported. And, and brethren, I have a big problem when I encounter people who we would say are not saved and I see the beauty of Jesus in them. I am confused when it happens because them not supposed to be saved. Uh oh. Honestly, now it ever happened to you? Lord, stand up if it ever happened to you. Just a few. Oh, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, 
So, brethren, if I can't have the real thing, as I've always said before, when I came into Pent I didn't come into Pentecost for dancing. I used to dance, you know. Yes, man. I used to dance. I used to go to dances. And those dances, you know what I mean? <laughs> so when I came into Pentecost, if I was coming for dancing, I wouldn't come. I never come for shouting. Any of you have ever been inside the National Stadium? You have been in there? You ever sit in the bleachers? Huh? You know that you have some advertising boards that are on top of the bleachers right around? You ever knock one of those boards yet? You ever jump up and slap one of those boards? Huh? Eh? You never do that yet? Well, I used to do that when Boys Town score. You hear BAM! Whole heap of shouting. I didn't come to Pentecost to shout. If it's that alone Jesus can give me, I don't want it. I never come to Pentecost to speak in tongues. For I tell you already, I was speaking in tongues out in the world. Whole heap of tongues. More tongues than now. I used to greet my brethren in tongues. Never have to feel none. Just greet them in tongues. All kind of situations cause me to speak in tongues. The same football. If a player on the side that I am cheering for get a penalty and kick it away, I speak in tongues. It was another spirit giving the utterance. And you wouldn't want to hear those tongues. And if you try to imagine those tongues, you might sin. So I didn't come into Pentecost for tongues. When I came to this church, I came because I was fed up with my life. And if all Jesus can give me is tongues and dancing and clapping and shouting, he can keep it. If this experience can't change my life, you're wasting my time, Jesus. You're playing around with me. Don't mess me. I'm in it for a change of life. I'm not in this thing for boyfriend and girlfriend, husband and wife business. I'm in this thing for change of life, man. Sick and tired of being sick and tired, man. Sick and tired of being a slave to the flesh, man. Sick and tired of corrupt mindsets, man. I want a change. I want the power of his resurrection. I'm not on this thing to sit on boards and committees and to hold positions and titles. That can't help me. That was never my bag. Never, never, no time at all. Save or unsafe, just was my bag. I never kept in nothing yet. I always say no, choose somebody else. Not even myself, me can captain good. I just want to be, I, brethren, I just want to be like Jesus so badly. And I'm so far away. We're going to get to that when Paul said, I count my, not, not myself to have apprehended. Oh, Jesus. But knowing Jesus Christ, oh, sorry. The Greek word for power. Power of his resurrection. 
That word is the same one that is used in Romans 1.16. It means that which overcomes resistance. See what I mean, brethren? I need something in my life that is so powerful that overcomes the resistance of the flesh. Dunamis. But knowing Jesus Christ also involves experiencing the fellowship of his suffering. Fellowship of his sufferings. The phrase is to be taken closely with the preceding clause, the power of his resurrection. Why, why, why is it to be linked? Because the word and links them and it links it links power of his resurrection and fellowship of his suffering and the known fellowship shares the same definite article with the word power so it's not in, in the Greek it's not I want to know the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings I want to know the power of of his resurrection and fellowship of his suffering. There's no definite article after the word resurrection. So, so what, what this indicates is that experiencing the power of the resurrected Christ and participating in his sufferings are not two separate experiences, but two aspects of the same experience you cannot enjoy the power of his resurrection without knowing the fellowship of his sufferings this one gives us a lot of trouble the Greek word here for fellowship the fellowship of his suffering means a joint participation now, what Paul is speaking about here is not the death of Christ on the cross. Because we can't die for others. His death was efficacious for all of us. Uh, he died for us. But the fellowship of his sufferings really means his sufferings for righteousness sake while he was on earth to share in the sufferings of Christ refers not merely to outward hardships and persecutions it involves that but more fundamentally it involves an inward experience just like how we said that the power of his resurrection was more something inside so now, what we have to look at, brethren, is, 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 is this way Christ suffered in order to live a godly life on earth. How sometimes what he did was misunderstood. And used against him. That caused suffering. Paul went through a lot of that. Fellowship of his sufferings. Paul wrote to the Corinthian church. And he said something remarkably. He said, most gladly will I spend and be spent for you. Though the more I love you, the less I be loved. Pastor, see if I was in this for myself, I would just, you Corinthians wouldn't even see me again. But I'm in this thing for Jesus. These are serious things, you know, brethren. 
Let's look at Hebrews 5, 1 to 10. And we get a glimpse, a hint of the sufferings of Christ. Just a little hint. The writer here says, every high priest is a man chosen to represent other people in their dealings with God. He presents their gifts to God and offers sacrifices for their sins. And he is able to deal gently with ignorant and wayward people because he himself is subject to the same weaknesses. So God didn't intend for church leaders to be perfect because perfect people can't represent sinful people. See what I'm saying, brethren? In order for God to pardon sinners, <laughs> he has to get a sinner to represent. So, when Aaron stood in the office of the high priest, for the years that he served. How many years did Aaron serve? A good while. Probably 30 odd years. When he served, Aaron, when, when Aaron went into the Holy of Holies with Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, and all the 12 tribes, on the breastplate. When he went in, he went in against the backdrop of the golden calf business. Aaron didn't go in on the basis of, I am right with God. I am Aaron. Aaron went in and said, if things went the right way, I shouldn't even be alive today, you know. So Aaron didn't go in saying, I have a right. Aaron went in and said, Yahweh, be merciful to your people. Remember the golden calf. I shouldn't have been speared, but you speared me. And none of your people don't do as bad as that. Can't be a high priest without that, you know, brethren. All of you that love ministry, and think you can be a pastor, make sure you can do that. And that is why, that is why God hardly uses a man that has not failed, you know. You notice the men in the Bible that God used. God is always able to say, Moses, remember that you are a murderer, you know. Abraham, you are one of the biggest liars there is. Jacob, how you must boast to me. You are a little swindler. Every man that God uses, you know. God can say, look, you don't deserve to be here, you know. It's the grace of God why you are here. We're not finished. That's just by the way. That is why he must offer sacrifices for his own sins as well as theirs. And no one can become a high priest simply because he wants such an honor. He must be called by God for this work just as Aaron was. So brethren... There are some things that have been decided before the foundation of the world. That is why Christ did not honor himself by assuming he could become high priest. No, he was chosen by God who said to him, you are my son. Today I have become your father. 
And in another passage, God said to him, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Here we go now. While Jesus was here on earth, he offered prayers and pleadings with a loud cry and tears to the one who could rescue him from death. And God heard his prayers because of his deep reverence for God. Even though Jesus was God's son, he learned obedience. How? How? From the things he suffered. In this way, by the way of suffering, God qualified him as a perfect high priest. And he became the source of eternal salvation for all those who obey him. It was through suffering that he was qualified. Tell the person beside you, can't run from it. Tell somebody, don't run from it. It's hot but hush. Brethren, what Paul is telling us, if Jesus went through it, I want to go through it too. I want to know you even there. Fellowship of your suffering. When Paul was ending his letter to the Galatians, he said, from henceforth, let no man trouble me, for I bear in my body the stigmata of the Lord, the marks of the Lord. If I, Paul was saying, if I were to take off my shirt and show you my chest and my back, all these for Jesus' sake, Cost me something to serve God. Paul wanted to so completely identify with his Lord in all things that he desired to participate in the same kind of sufferings that his Lord had endured. Paul wished to be just like Jesus. He felt that it was an honor to live as Christ did. To manifest the spirit that he did. And to suffer in the same manner. All that Christ did and suffered was glorious in Paul's view. And he wished in all things to resemble him. Many persons are willing to reign with Christ, but they are not willing to suffer with him. Some of us can't even walk down Wildman Street and hand out a tract. That is too much for us. I think sometimes Jesus just hears us when we talk about we love him and just laugh. I, I don't know if I've ever said this before. You know, should I say it? I used to be, I used to be on the second shift when we used to have a shift system. Two times we had it, I was on the second shift. And I would come to teach the adult class on the second shift. My wife can tell you. And when I came, there were people here to be baptized. So, well, let me not mention that part. 
But after the second shift ended, after the second shift ended, people were here to be baptized too. That was sometime in the three o'clock, you know. I remember evening service. And there were times when I had to, my children were young. Babies, some of them. I had to say to my wife, I call her baby. She's a big baby, but she's still a baby. You used to say, baby, you go home. You go home. You know, I, because you know, people are here. And it used to happen regularly. So one Sunday now after, I had finished baptizing the people that were here. I now start to walk downtown to the bus stop. And I said, I, it's not right. Every Sunday, so. One of the men, them would drive car, can't stay behind sometime and baptize them, man. Why always me? And right on Charles Street, right there, but further out, past the stoplight, near to where Sister Jackie, where you used to work first time there. What do you call that office again? It was statistics, but not statistics anymore. Right out there. Near where Father Holong have that building there. A voice just said to me, You're complaining? I went to Calvary for you. And you can't stay behind and baptize few people every Sunday. Is that you're complaining about? My brethren, I start Christ same time. In the middle road in a walk in, on the sidewalk. Take out my handkerchief. I said, Lord, I'm so sorry. I'm going to try not to complain again. Some of the things that we complaining that you have to stay behind to baptize people that you say that is why you're in the thing to see people get saved. When them get saved and to be baptized, now you complain. I tell you what had to happen during our brethren. After a time now, I used to come Sunday night service less and less. There had to be a little. You see what I mean? Because you couldn't wake up the little children them so quick to come back again. So that was what had to happen. But at the complaining stop. Complaining stop. Because you can't complain about the blessing of God. <laughs> so you see how we can be? Eh? Now I look back at it and say, why couldn't I just have suffered then? That wasn't any suffering, but why couldn't I have gone through it and rejoiced? Why it had to take a rebuke? Many desire to wear a crown of glory, but they do not desire to wear a crown of thorns. Many ask to share in his glory, but they would never ask to share his grief or pain. This was not the feeling of Paul. He wished in all things to be just like Christ. And hence he counted it an honor to be permitted to suffer as he did. This is in Hence, Christianity. See, brethren, this is not the playground thing. This is not the hot business and whether we must wear open toe shoes or that. We've gone far past that now. This is where now it begins to cost you. This is where now you begin to want to become like Jesus so much that you start to see that there's a big price to be paid. You realize now that you can't, in this kind of Christianity, you will never be able to justify yourself to everybody. 
You're going to just have to allow some people to just have a bad impression about you and still go through and do the work. You understand what I'm saying, brethren? Brother Michael, there are people that just will never like you. You still have to go through. Can't stop. A man like Paul, people were saying, a money him want. And Paul said, you saying that? I do him take a cent from you, and you saying that? What, what could he do? The thing with Paul was that is either you loved him or you, you hated him. That was the kind of man he was. He was extreme. Paul said, I wish every man was like, had the gift like me. Don't get married. Live a single life. But he said, every man don't have that gift. How many men here you think you have that gift? The true Christian will esteem it a privilege to be made just like Jesus Christ, not only in glory, but in suffering. Is this how we feel? If we do, it is evidence that we love him. If we do not, then perhaps we have never fully appreciated the true nature of our salvation. Nobody told me that this was part of the package when I received the Holy Ghost. Maybe that's what you're saying now, eh? Brethren, you, when you get into this realm of Christianity... You, 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 you are, when you get here, this is where, this is where carnality begins to go. And carnality don't just mean sex. That's what some of us think. Carnality means thinking as if you weren't saved. You have the Holy Ghost and you're baptized, but you're operating like a man who's not saved. Everything is the flesh. A man punch you, you have to punch them back. Carnality that. A man hate you, you have to hate them back. Carnality. A man do your bad things, you have to do them back bad things. Carnality. When you get into this realm now, you begin to say, no, I'm going glory in this because I realize that God working out something in my life. You want us to prove it to you? Brethren, you can find 2 Corinthians 13 there. Please. 2 Corinthians 13. New Living Translation. How did I leave that out of my notes? I don't know how. Second Corinthians 13. Twelve, sorry, twelve, twelve. I'm very sorry, twelve. Second Corinthians twelve from verse one. 2 Corinthians 12, from verse 1. This boasting will do no good, but I must go on. 
I will reluctantly tell you about visions and revelations from the Lord. Yes? I was caught up to the third heaven 14 years ago. Whether I was in my body or out of my body, I don't know. Only God knows. Yes, only God knows whether I was in my body or outside my body. But I do know that I was caught up to paradise and heard things so astounding that they cannot be expressed in words. Things no human is allowed to tell. That experience is worth boasting about. Now, now see what many Bible commentators believe, folks, that Paul had this experience when he was stoned at Lystra. And the brethren felt that he was dead. He was taken up as dead. That's what the Bible says. Many people believe that that was when he had this revelation. So when Paul said boasting about it, it was not a pretty thing. Because most of us would prefer not to have the revelation if it's so we go and get it. If a man have to lick you down with stone, if you get a revelation, might as, you know, so well then, Lord, you know, reveal it. I might say, reveal it to Brother Shea, Lord. <laughs> I'm not saying that Brother Shea's head is tough, you know. Verse 6. Sorry, go back to verse 5. That experience is worth boasting about, but I'm not going to do it. I will boast only about my what? <laughs> How many of us do that? You boast about your weaknesses. If I wanted to boast, I would be no fool in doing so. Because I would be telling the truth, but I won't do it. Because I don't want anyone to give me credit beyond what they can see in my life. Are here in my message. Even though I have received such wonderful revelations from God. So to keep me from becoming proud. I was given a thorn in my flesh. A messenger from Satan to torment me. And keep me from becoming proud. Three different times I begged the Lord to take it away. Each time he said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So now I am glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses and in the insults, hardships, persecutions, and troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. What Paul says he takes pleasure in? Weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecution, troubles. How many of us take pleasure in insults? In hardships, in persecutions and troubles. Some of us don't even know, don't even know what that means. So what I'm, this is intense Christianity that we're talking about, brethren. This is not the lollipop one. Paul gone far beyond rules here now. Rules can't help you when you're gone into this realm.
Knowing Jesus Christ in the biblical sense is to have intimate personal knowledge involving experience and appropriation. Knowing Christ, experiencing the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings are not three distinct events, but are all part of the same event. Wow. How easy it is for us to complain, brethren. Even, but, but, I don't even know. It's, I, I was sharing with my wife a couple of his weeks or months ago. And she asked me to share it with the young married couples class. And I did two Sundays where I just did a little study on the words help meet. Where the Lord said, I will make him and help meet for him. We think that it is one word, help meet. We think it's one word. It's not one word. It's not one Greek word and it's not one English word. It's a help suitable for him. No, that word meet, M-E-E-T, is a translation of a Hebrew word. Sorry, I said Greek. Hebrew word, which means really a help opposed to him a help standing over against him a help antagonistic so some of you who not reading the bible and living working your marriage based on bible you're going to have you're going to make shipwreck if you don't change I'm promising you that. Because you see, what we think is that marriage must make me happy. God didn't design marriage primarily for your happiness. He designed marriage for your perfection. See, God did not want another Adam for Adam. God said, see, we make a big thing out of what we call compatibility. But God makes a big thing out of complementarity. You are different. Learn to use your differences to help each other and make each other stronger. I don't necessarily want you to be the same. From the original woman, the very word that was used tells us that. But you see, we have the Western culture in our mind. The Eastern thought, the way the Eastern countries think, is more harmonizing with the Bible than the way we in the West think. Because, check it out, brethren, in a lot of the Eastern countries, marriages are arranged. Till today, families come together and say, you go and marry you from your picnic. And guess what? Those marriages do better than the ones over here that we pick for ourselves. Hello? Read it for yourself if you don't believe me. Check it for yourself. Because you see, fairy tale we read, they live happily ever after. Nonsense. If it's that you're going into marriage for, change your mind. Get ready for problems. I was speaking with perhaps my wife and I, 
we were speaking with perhaps the foremost marriage counselor, relationship counselor in Jamaica. And he told us, he said to us, he said, based on the research that I and my colleagues have done, both locally and overseas, we have found that the marriages that last the longest and are the healthiest are not necessarily those where the people are compatible, but where they are different, but have learned to use their differences to complement each other. He said to us, he said, compatibility is like this. He said, complementarity is like this. He said, you will agree that this is easier to achieve than this. But he said, this is a tighter hole. But you say, we now, so it revolutionized the way we do premarital counseling. You looking for everybody to be the same. What need to be the same is a set of core values. That's what need to be the same. But you n don't worry to think that because see, see my precious wife there is very few things that we like the same. The, 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 the same counsel I'm telling you about. He told us you are diametrically opposed to each other. That is after we were married for 25 years. We know that long time. We have learned to love beyond our differences. I think I need to get the married couples together one Sunday evening and teach them this, you know. I don't know where we get this. This, this, this. Rose-colored glasses from. I must be happy. I'm not happy. Yes, are you being perfected? See what God wants is somebody to, to bring an opposing view so that you can see another side and say, you know, that really sound good. That could be right, you know, because nobody grows when they are comfortable. You only grow when there is creative tension and you realize that Sometimes when my wife rubs me the wrong way and I react, I come away saying, that's something wrong with you, John. Huh? That's not a way a Christian, a child of God should react. Even if you think you're right, you don't talk to your wife that way, son. You're losing it. Then I have to go now into prayer. I said, fix that, Lord. That's not how a man of God should operate. I'm not talking about a pastor. Uh, every man that wants to love God is a man of God. See what I'm saying, folks? If she was just like me, one man told me, he said, Pastor, me and my wife never have a quarrel yet, you know. Anything she says, I say, yes, dear. And I go and do what I want. You people that married, you understand what I'm saying? Another, I, 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 my wife was making a presentation at one point in time. And I was sitting beside a couple. And she was talking about forgiveness. And the wife said, you never tell me that you're sorry yet. And the husband said, well, you know me never wrong.
Listen, brethren, listen. Listen, listen. Open your eyes about this marriage thing. You're striving for happiness. And love it, dovey. Deal with what God sent to you. We were both listening, watching a DVD. This pastor was making a presentation on marriage. And said that after Bible study, a lady came up to him. I said, Pastor, I wish if my husband could be like you. You are so patient. You are so kind. You are so gentle. I admire you so much. The man said, Lady, you see me on a Sunday and a Wednesday. You don't know me. He said, You see that lady over there? Ask her about me. When she finished, tell you about me. You're glad to stay with for your little husband. <laughs> me you see me sunday and wednesday and i'm so gentle and kind and nice i wish my husband could be like you really if you're not prepared to deal with suffering don't get married it's for your perfection happiness is a little byproduct that's not what god that is not God's primary intention. The very word he used. You go and check it out. Well, yeah, check it out. Brethren, I'm saying this not, not to boast, but I'm saying this to, to, to help you. It, sometimes it is helpful when you're studying the Old Testament. I, I, I have a friend who lives in Canada who introduced me to Hebrew commentaries, commentaries written by rabbis. If you, when you are studying, especially the first five books of the Bible, it is good to read what the Hebrew rabbis have to say. Very, very good. So, so I, I just thought I would tell you that. Because I'm hearing some things now about marriage, I'm wondering if we're dealing with Bible. Or if we're dealing with Oprah. Or if we're dealing with Slayer or All Woman. What we're dealing with? Everywhere I go, I hear in some strange things. So here's where Paul is now. He's saying, four things I want in my life. I want to be discovered by men to be in Christ. By the very life that I live. Be found in him. I want to come to know him better all the time. By experiencing the same power that raised him from the dead. Surging through my own being. And becoming a joint participant in his sufferings for righteousness sake. Paul says, when that happens to me, I will be made conformable to Christ's death. The words made conformable mean literally to bring to the same form with some other person. Not physically. In its verb form, the Greek word means to give outward expression of one's inner intrinsic nature. While it's not denying the possibility that the reference can be to physical death, the context appears to demand an interpretation which speaks of an inward transformation of one's nature. Paul's desire was that he might so come to know his Lord, experience the power of his resurrection operating in his life, and a joint participation in his sufferings that he would be brought to a place where he would become both as to his inner heart life and also as to the outward expression of his inner heart life like his Lord with respect to his death. As we have noted, we are not merely referring to physical death to the physical death of Jesus. But his death to self. 
as illustrated so vividly to the Philippians in the self-emptying of the Lord Jesus in chapter 2, verse 7. Taught it not robbery to be equal with God, but emptied himself, made himself of no reputation. There is no way that he could have come to save me and retain what he had to give up. No way, couldn't do the two. In order to become my savior, he had to stop expressing himself as God. This self-emptying was true of our Lord, not only in his act of becoming incarnate and of stooping to the death of the cross, but also one that conditioned his entire earthly life and made it the beautiful life it was. This was a death to self, a denying of self for the blessing of others. We're going to read some passages that speak to this. And this is what Paul said, when these things happen to me, I will be like this. John 8, 28 to 30. So Jesus said, when you have lifted up the Son of Man on the cross, then you will understand that I am he. I do nothing on my own, but say only what the Father taught me. And the one who sent me is with me. He has not deserted me, for I always do what pleases him. We sometimes do what pleases him. Paul said, this me you want. But to get at this, I have to deal with knowing him, power of his resurrection, fellowship of his sufferings. It's here I want to go, but I have to deal with this. Message has it this way. So Jesus tried again. When you raise up the Son of Man, then you will know who I am. But I'm not making this up, but speaking only what the Father taught me. The one who sent me stays with me. He doesn't abandon me. He sees how much joy I take in pleasing him. So those who say, Pastor, you are saying that we must live our life based on rules. So that means we can live any way. You never hear about intense Christianity. If you, you have never heard about intense Christianity. When you live this way, you really don't need no rules. You're taking pleasure in pleasing him. That is your goal. To what Mark says. And he went forward a little and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, I, this is Jesus as, as his most vulnerable. Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Never forget that Jesus prayed that prayer. Take away this cup from me. When you are struggling to do the will of God, understand that he knows what you're going through. Because he said, take away this cup from me. And he knew the cup was the will of God. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou wilt. You know, I, I kind of love the message. The message rendering is very moving, very moving. Going a little ahead, he fell to the ground and prayed for a way out. Papa, Father, you can, can't you? Get me out of this. Take this cup away from me. But please, not what I want. What do you want? Can you lift your hands and pray that right now? Not what I want. What do you want? I, I'm, I'm making a decision about marriage. I really want to do this. But Papa, not what I want. 
What do you want? What do you want? Intense Christianity. What do you want? Nobody can legislate this now. This now you're on your own with God. If you don't have a relationship, you're going to break down. Organization and pastor can't help you with this. You have to know God for yourself. When you are here now, nobody could help Jesus. Nobody could help him. He was on his own now. Relationship. If, if he never had a relationship, he couldn't say, Papa. So, Daddy, help me out now. But, what do you want? Intense Christianity. That's where the church must go and stop the Dolly House business and the jungle gym business and the criticizing of each other. Look at Jesus and judge yourself by Jesus. Die the death. Being made conformable unto his death. That's where it is, brethren. If we don't get here, when, when we are nowhere, this is where we have to go. This was what Paul was striving for. The most radical conformity is here indicated. It was not only the undergoing of a physical death like that of Christ, but a conformity to the spirit and character of his life. The beauty, meekness, lowliness, and submission of Christ. Is this what we are striving for? If not, why not? Let's lift our hands and worship Jesus. We're going to finish up quickly. In verse 11, Paul writes, If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. The expression, if by any means, is not an expression of doubt, but one of humility. It's not that Paul doubted he would get there, but he, he's saying, boy, if only. It is a modest but assured hope. Paul expresses a sense of expectation and hope with humility. Paul, Paul does not appear here to be speaking of the future resurrection of the physical body of the saint. Now, no, that's verse 11 where it says, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. I am saying that I don't think he's speaking about the rapture because he spoke with confidence about that in Philippians in, sorry, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And in, in Thessalonians, we which are alive and remain and so. I, I think he, he seems, in, to, in my view, to, and, and so I'm saying I could be wrong, brethren. And I, I, I'm willing to admit that, to concede that point. I, I wouldn't push this very hard. But to me, he seems to have in mind here the spiritual resurrection of the believing sinner. A resurrection out from a state in which he is dead in trespasses and sins to one in which he is alive with the divine life of God motivating his being. So, so Paul is saying, I want to come to the, that state when, when I, I'm just on fire for God and, and, and all the deadness that is in me begin to slip away and, and I'm just caught up in, in a different rapture, the rapture of serving God based on an inner motivation and not what somebody tell me to do. But, but I, I, I just love him. Yeah. 
Paul desires the full operation of the divine life to surge through his Christian experience in such a manner that the fragrance of the life of his Lord may permeate his entire life. This is to the goal to which he is striving and the goal to which he has not yet attained. When he attained this goal, he will experience what he longed for in his desire that he might be found by men to be in Christ, to have him as his righteousness, to come to know him in an experiential way, to feel the power that raised Christ from the dead surging through his being, to have a participation in his suffering for righteousness' sake, and to be made conformable to his death to self. Based on the analysis given above, one can restructure verses 10 to 11 into two sentences. All I want is to know Christ. Oh, brethren, could, you, could we honestly say that all I want is to know Christ? Namely, to experience the power of his resurrection, sharing his suffering. I want to know Christ by becoming like him in death in the hope that I myself will be raised from death to life. Intense Christianity. Let's stand and worship Jesus. Brother, I, I, I want to apologize to you, but I'm, I'm going to ask us to let's pray. I, I, I just don't feel like right now I can just read announcements in this atmosphere. I, I, if, if we can later, I'll do it, but let, let's just take a minute or two and let's just talk to Jesus, please. If you have to go, we understand.
Let's stand. Oh, to be like thee. Oh, to be like thee. Blessed Redeemer, pure as thou art. Come in thy sweetness. Come in thy fullness. Stamp thine own image deep on my Oh, to be like thee. Oh, to be like thee. Blessed Redeemer. Pure as thou art. Come in thy sweetness. Come in thy fullness, stamp thy own image deep, deep on my, oh, to be like thee, blessed Redeemer, this is my constant Longing and prayer, gladly I'll forfeit all of earth's treasures. Jesus, thy perfect likeness to wear, oh, to be like thee, oh, to be like thee. Blessed Redeemer, pure as thou art, come in thy sweetness, come in thy fullness, stamp thine own image deep on Let's worship the Lord, everyone. Lift your hands and worship Jesus. Stamp thine own image. See, folks, the thing we need to get rid of is our image. We need to get rid of our image. Too much of our image. Too much of us. Stamp thine own image. Your image. Deep. Deep on my heart. Deep on my heart. Deep on my heart. Deep on, stamp thine, oh, your image. Deep on my heart. <sighs> oh, to be like thee. I remember when I, you know, little after I got saved, I heard somebody sing that song. And I, I, just something in me just wanted, I wanted it right then and there. That's been a long time and I'm still not close. But I, I follow after. This one thing I do. This one thing I do. I sing this song so often. My little devotion, oh, to be like thee. Yes, 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 yes. Lift your hands and worship Jesus. This is it, brethren, intense Christianity. This is not the shouting, dancing, speaking in tongues Christianity. This is the, the Calvary Christianity, the Gethsemane Christianity takes us beyond an emotional high to a place of death. You may be seated, please. If you are a member of Zone 3, Sister Stacy Ann Thomas 
would like to meet with you immediately after the Bible study. I would like to suggest, Sister Stacy, that you meet with the folks on the choir loft. Funeral for Sister Nesta Bailey, who was a former member of Pentecostal Tabernacle, will be held here tomorrow at 10 a.m. There will not be a deliverance service tomorrow, which normally would be held at 12 noon. It will not be held. There is combined choir practice tomorrow at 6 p.m. This is in respect of Pentecost Sunday. It's a very important choir practice. The meeting of the discipleship ministry, which was scheduled for tomorrow, has been postponed. Very importantly, brethren, the Early Childhood Institute and the high school are having a barbecue and inspiration on Friday. Very important. The meals will begin to be served at 11 a.m. The inspiration will be held here. It begins at 6.30 p.m. The cost of the ticket is $1,000 and 1,200 if you are having fish. Please contact Sister Mavis Ferguson, Sister Veronica Wilby, Sister Julianne Beckford, Sister Yvonne Stewart for tickets, or anybody connected to the Early Childhood Institute or the high school. Um, brethren, on Friday will be the funeral service of my mother. It will be held at the St. Andrew Parish Church in Half a Tree. It starts at 11.30. Um, brethren, they are very disciplined and orderly in the way they conduct their funeral services. So, for instance, once the casket comes into the church, you cannot view the body. And they don't open the casket for last viewing when you're leaving. So I don't want anybody to come there. If you come late, that's it. Just look at the program if you get one. Don't want nobody to ask them for a last look. They have been very kind and gracious to us. And I just want to not do anything to offend them. All right, folks? So from 10.30, I believe, to 11.30, there is a section which is open to everybody that the body can be viewed once it comes into the church. That's it. All right, folks? All right? Now, folks, don't pressure yourself to go. Don't put yourself under any pressure. Please, don't put yourself under any pressure. Just, I'm, I'll be happy if you come. But don't lose your job to come. You hear, folks? If you're going to lose your job, don't come. Because I, I'll be glad for the support, but not at, to, at the expense of you being without a job. So I, I just wanted to let you know that. And the body will be interred right at the cemetery where the church is. Okay? And I, I just want to say that the persons who... The, 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 the minister in charge of the church and those who work with them have been very kind, very gracious, more than I expected. And I give the Lord thanks for them. Amen. And I, I have learned from them how to conduct ministry in a better way. I must confess that to you. And our youth will be having a prayer walk at the park at Sherlock Crescent on Saturday at 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. At 10 a.m. on Saturday, the funeral service for Sister Alma Davis will be held here at Pentecostal Tabernacle. Please try and support that service. And Sister Millwood will be coming to tell us about Operation Invasion at Duhenny Park on Sunday. Please, just let's give her a listening ear as she comes. All right? All right, brethren? We have started our work on the wall.
we have started our work. The backhoe came and dug out the foundation. And it took us a good time to remove the tree. Deeply rooted. And I said to the men who were around, see how easy it is to push down a building that man has made, but a tree that God has planted, it wouldn't come out. Come, Sister Milord. Ushers, run up here quickly, please. Can you run, ushers? That would be nice to see our ushers running. Praise the Lord, everybody. On Sunday morning, all roads will lead to Sherlock Crescent. We are going to be witnessing to the households in the Duane Park area. We were hoping to go back into the night, but due to some constraints, we were also hoping to go on Tuesday night also. But what we have decided to do, we'll go all out Sunday morning. All out Sunday morning. Every one of us will go all out Sunday morning. We will stay an extended time. And then we rest in the evening. On Wednesday, we are going full force. Everyone, we are going out to a great night service on the play fields. I'm asking you... Also, normally we would be um, providing water and so on. We are not able to do this time around because um, our coolers are not working. So we are not able to provide you with cool water. What we are asking you to do to bring your igloos and ice and so on and bring enough to share with others. Praise God, everybody. So we meet here on Sunday morning at 8 o'clock for prayer. And then we're not necessarily asking those who are in doing the park to drive all the way here. But if you can to give someone a ride, please do so. And um, we will do a little business um, receiving the offerings because we need um, your offerings. So we need to receive your offerings on Sunday morning. Right, and if you, if you want to take it to do any park, we could arrange for Brother Mike to have a little bag somewhere to receive it. Praise a big bag. <laughs> so if you want to take it to do any park, we will receive it. Because, brethren, you know, I think you have an idea of the financial situation, not only here, but in our personal lives and in the country as a whole. So we need every every offering that you can give. So come out Sunday morning. We are going into any park in Jesus' name, and we are going back on Wednesday night. Praise the Lord, everybody. The Lord bless you. Thank you, Sister Millwood. Brethren, what we said about the offering is very important because a lot of times, most times when we have an invasion, the offering is very low, and Part of the reason why we can't go on Sunday night and on Tuesday is because we just don't have sufficient funds. That's just part of the reason. So please bring your offering on Sunday. Don't, well, you know, brethren, we, we don't want you to stay away. We, we, we want all to participate. And I... I I, I listen to our good talk about loving Jesus, you know. I, I listen to it, and I, I guess the Lord listens to it too, but even in our own lives, we say actions speak louder than words. And uh, I, 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 I don't necessarily want to interject something that is not necessarily gospel here, but, you know, there was a great Jamaican singer that, passed away last year, I think, and he had a song that was popular that said, I want a love I can feel. That's the only kind of love I think is real. Don't want to be going by something I've heard for action speak louder than words. I wonder if Jesus feels that way too. Wonder if he wants a love he can feel. 
don't want to be going by something he's heard. Let's all stand. Uh, Sister Karen Mullings, I would like to see you afterwards. There's somebody else I need to see. Brother Callum, I need to see Brother Gillan Callum. After service, please. Would you bow your heads? Lord Jesus, you are our God. We say that, Lord, but help us to settle it. Help us to act as if you were our God. Help us to love you with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, all our strength. Lord Jesus, we are tired of the talk, tired of the rhetoric, tired of singing songs that we cannot identify with, tired of lifting hands and saying things that are not true, tired of empty promises, tired of words, our words are not enough. Show us how to love. Oh, God, help us to grapple with intense Christianity. There are some of us already, the word is being robbed from our hearts by the wicked one. Some of us are already forgetting what we have heard. And we will leave this place and it will be for us as if we had never come. But Lord, let a spiritual miracle be wrought and help us to remember what we have heard. Not because of the teacher, but because of the God who we want to relate to and with. Bless us in a special way, Lord. Conform us to your image every day a little more. Being like you, talking like you, thinking like you, living like you. Until we are like you. The offering that we will receive, Lord, please bless it and help it to be used to minister to others. Those who are to meet with different ones, help us to do that. We commit ourselves into your hands. In Jesus' name. Lord, bless your brethren. Just move around and greet a few people in the name of the Lord. Please come and give an offering. Best offering that you can. Please come and give an offering, best offering that you can. Please come and give an offering, best offering that you can. Please come and give an offering, best offering that you can. Please come and give an offering, best offering that you can. Please come and give an offering, the best offering that you can. Please come and give an offering, best offering that you can.